Spring is here. About time, huh? On this week's Center of It All, we wrap up tax season, dive into allergy season, and cook up a delicious yet classic soup. These and so much more coming up next on the Center of It All. Welcome to another Center of It All. Thank you so much for joining. I'm your host, Alex Rabb. April is here and that means it's time to pay up. Oh yes, tax season. Whether you do them yourself or you go to a professional, H&R Block has some really great advice. It's everyone's favorite time of the year. No, not spring, tax season. Now don't fret, April 15th isn't upon us yet. So that means there's still time. Now the decision is up to you on how you want to file them. There are free programs online, professional programs you can still do at home, or you can go and see a professional face-to-face. -face. Tom Kirsch, a H&R Block franchise owner in State College, is confident that your worries will leave you if you walk into his branch. There's a good reason for it, too. This is what H&R Block does. We, we do taxes 12 months out of the year. Um, our employees are training almost the whole time that they're outside of tax season getting prepared for the next tax season. So we're able to handle many different situations. So what records should you keep? Any expense that you want to claim on your tax return, you need to keep those receipts. Anything that verifies just about anything that'll be claimed on the return, whether it be a credit or a deduction, um, you need to keep those um, not only for the tax preparation, but in case the IRS wants to look at your return at a later time. The at-home computer programs have step-by-step -step instructions on what to do, but at H&R Block, the process is easy as well. If they're a first-time filer, we ask them to bring in a copy of last year's return if they had filed last year, because sometimes there's information that needs to come off of that return to go on to the new return. Um, if they have all their information with them, all their W-2s and their 1099s and anything else we need to prepare their return, we can do an interview with the client, complete the return, have them sign all the papers, and they can walk out with a completed tax return. So remember to keep your tax returns from the last three years. Have them into the IRS by April 15th. It doesn't have to be scary or confusing, as there's a lot of help out there. Happy filing! Our Andrew Callista went over to Penn State's Educational Gaming Commons Lab to unlock some knowledge on how video games can be more than just fun. The history of video games dates all the way back to the 1940s. And since Atari hit it big in 1977, parents all over have been telling us that we should be doing our homework and video games will rot our brains out. But that is not the case in the EGC lab here at Penn State, where games are taking education in a whole new direction. I think sometimes people worry that games are meant to replace things. Uh, games are like any tool, uh, you know, like your CMS, like PowerPoint, like, uh, like a chalkboard uh, for all intents and purposes. There are things that they do really well, there are things that they don't do as well. And I think that using them in a way that's complementary to the learning objectives you have as a teacher, uh, to the strengths and weaknesses of your students, uh, all of these are different ways that you have to think about factoring games into the classroom. Chris Stubbs, project manager of the Educational Gaming Commons, says it was no easy task convincing scholars that games have a great value. The general sentiment among faculty has sort of gotten more and more open to the idea of using games. I think when we started there was a lot of skepticism, a lot of hesitation, and rightfully so. It was a new technology, a new idea uh, for a lot of people, but I think over time, We've seen people open up more and more to it. And so now, because we have more games out there, because there's more research out there, people will approach us and say, hey, I have this idea, uh, or you know, I think even better, I have this problem, this academic problem. Do you think games can be something that might help with that? Stubbs says games do help. Students learn in different ways and at different paces. And any way to branch out of the classroom enhances the learning experience. A lot of emerging technologies in education are about making the learning experience something that's a little bit more personal to you. So if you're a student that wants to get those little bites of content while you're waiting for the bus, while you're hanging out waiting for your next class to start, uh, that's what we want to be able to enable for people. And games, uh, in a way, let you do that, particularly game, video games that are played online. The information age is about 24-7 connection. So why would we not want to have that in our classrooms? It's funny, it, you know, 
people, I think, look at it both ways, uh, depending on what your perspective is. Some people are so concerned about the impact of games that they worry it'll take over traditional teaching. And some people think games are this sort of childish, frivolous medium that can't possibly have any impact on anything. The games are having an impact. Stubbs says data show students are connected at all hours of the day. For more information on the EGC, check out gaming.psu.edu. For the center of it all, I'm Andrew Callista. Thanks, Andrew. Remember, the EGC lab is available to all students, not just those in a particular department. But stick around. When we return, we'll head over to Rehabilitation Hospital in Pleasant Gap. Welcome back to the center of it all. We have an amazing rehabilitation hospital right in our backyard. I went over to Health South Nittany Valley Rehabilitation Hospital to see exactly what they had to offer. You may have heard of Health South Nittany Valley Rehabilitation Hospital. It's a higher level of care in comparison to any other rehabilitation service in the community. Within their 100-mile radius, they cover around five counties and some outlying areas. The majority of our patients do come from acute care hospitals in our territory or bordering territories. Um, for instance, our largest referral source is our local hospital, Mount Nittany Health, and we um, also receive patients from outlying territories. It could be as far as Philadelphia and Pittsburgh. Patients as young as teenagers and as old as centurions can also come from home if any rehab service is needed. We have regis certified registered rehabilitation nurses, um, technical staff, then um, the therapy staff is physical therapists, occupational therapists, speech pathology. We also have a psychologist on staff, registered dietitians, uh, pharmacy. So um, they all come together to um, provide services as an interdisciplinary team. And that's a really critical concept in an acute rehabilitation hospital because they're led by a physician, physiatrist, um, who helps to make decisions about how we're going to get patients back home to the community. And so they all sit at the table at least once a week for each patient and make those decisions and put plans together. It's unique, but that concept is what makes the difference in the higher level of care. At Health South Nittany Valley Rehabilitation Hospital, their stroke program is their number one program. They have a disease-specific care certification, which follows the American Stroke Association's management of adult stroke care guidelines. We really focus on the patient and family or family and caregiver, getting the patient back home to the community, making sure that they have the information they need to sustain their rehab goals and to be functional in the community. It seems as though a lot of people in our society don't understand stroke and post-stroke care. That's why Health South Nittany Valley Rehabilitation Hospital has free seminars for the community throughout the year. We're very excited about an upcoming event with Mount Nittany Health. It will be held at the Galen and Nancy Drabblebiss Auditorium at Mount Nittany Medical Center on May 21st from 6 to 7.30 p.m. Dr. Pete Roy will be presenting about how to recognize and act on signs of a stroke quickly. No matter what degree of medical service the patient needs, Health South can help. Patients that come to our hospital are required by Medicare to, to participate in at least three hours of rehabilitation a day. And that's usually combination therapy, um, usually um, a combination of PT, OT, and speech therapy. Um, patients um, will participate in all three therapies throughout the day, um, allowing time um, for rest and um, care and attention to medical needs. Health South as a corporation gives out the National President's Circle Award to the CEOs who are operating at the top hospitals in the company. It is based on outcomes. The Department of Health also presented them with the state's first award for excellence in health care compliance. And there's more. Health South Nittany Valley Rehabilitation Hospital ended 2012, um, actually uh, number eight out of the 100 hospital system. And one of the other recognitions that we received for 2012 was um, a top 10% recognition for the uniform data system for medical rehabilitation. That is the database that we use to report our outcomes to Medicare. And um, there's 787 hospitals um, throughout the nation in that database. So we are in the top 10% um, and have been for three consecutive years. Health South Nittany Valley Rehabilitation Hospital has amputee, better breathers, brain injury, heart failure, multiple sclerosis, and stroke support groups as well. 
They deserve every award and recognition that they receive by continuing to be one of the best higher level of care rehabilitation hospitals in our area. Remember that if you find yourself or a loved one in need of rehab, you have to go out and evaluate the programs and find what's best for you. Health South Nittany Valley Rehabilitation Hospital may be the place you need. Visit NittanyValleyRehab.com for more information. Now we have to take another break, but we'll head right into the kitchen with our resident foodie, Mel Prosciutti. Hello, I'm Alex Rabb. I'm excited for our kitchen encounters. Mel Prosciutti shows us how to make a creamy tomato soup along with baked bagel chips. Let's go. April showers bring May flowers. That's the good news. April showers also bring a lot of rainy days to Happy Valley. When that happens, I just want a bowl of warm, comforting soup. But I don't mean the thick and chunky kind that I would serve in the fall. I want something smooth and creamy. Today, I'm gonna to be making my sweet and smoky cream of roasted tomato soup and I'm gonna be serving it with some parsley, pepper, and Parmesan bagel crisps. Let's get started. Roasted cream of tomato soup is one of my favorite soups and it couldn't be easier. In fact, I'm gonna show you a way to make it where the oven's going to do almost all of the work for us. What I have here in a little food storage bag is a pound and a half of really coarsely chopped onions and an entire head of garlic that's been peeled and all the cloves are in there. It's approximately about two ounces of garlic cloves. I'm going to add four tablespoons, one, two, three, four, of olive oil to the bag, close it up, and toss it around really good. Just going to put all of this out on a large baking tray that I've lined with aluminum foil and a piece of parchment paper. We're just going to spread the onions and garlic out to make a nice bed for our tomatoes. Now I'm going to put 10 sprigs of fresh thyme. The smell of fresh thyme is absolutely wonderful and it's available in our markets all year round but if you really can't find it do not be afraid to sprinkle this lightly with some dried thyme leaves it'll all come out a little bit of salt lightly season it I'm using sea salt and a really nice cracked black peppercorn blend that's cracked black peppercorn blend Next, I have four pounds of tomatoes. And I'm just gonna quickly, I'm not gonna dump these on the pan because I just wanna make sure that all of the tomatoes are on the bed and I want them facing upward, meaning skin side down, so that the skins hold all of the juices as the tomatoes roast. Now I'm gonna take four more tablespoons of olive oil and just lightly drizzle the top of the tomatoes. A little more salt. A little more peppercorn blend. And my secret ingredient, four tablespoons of dark brown sugar sprinkled over the top is going to caramelize these with a really sweet flavor. And once you do this once, you're never not going to use the brown sugar. I'm gonna pop these in a 375 degree oven for an hour and a half, just until the tops of these tomatoes are caramelized and they've got a little bit of a char to them. While my tomatoes are in the oven roasting, I'm gonna prepare my bagel chips. And I have one rule about making bagel chips, four. What do I mean by four? Well, first of all, your bagels need to be old, three to four days old. When I know I'm making bagel chips, I often buy a bag of them and stick them in the refrigerator for a few days. And if you have a bagel that's been around for two or three days, use it to make a bagel chip. And another part about four, what I want to do is slice my bagel into four 
discs, about a quarter of an inch thick. If you slice them into five, what's going to happen is they're gonna burn before they crisp. So all we wanna do, perfect size for dipping, dolloping, slathering. To make our spread for the tops of our bagels, I have one stick of butter and it's past room temperature. It's really, really soft. I'm adding a teaspoon of parsley flakes, a half teaspoon of garlic powder, and a half teaspoon of coarse black pepper. I'm just gonna take an ordinary spoon, stir this all together. It takes about 10 seconds. Now what I've done here is I've sliced two bagels. And all I'm going to do is start buttering the tops of each one of these. And if you have children, this is a great job to give them. Just each piece at a time. My bagel chips are all buttered with that wonderful fragrant spread. Now it's time for the Parmesan cheese. And I'm just gonna take my handy dandy little microplane grater and my real deal Parmigiano Reggiano cheese and just go over the tops of them with a nice coating. I don't wanna be too heavy on the cheese because I don't want it to burn. Now I'm gonna pop these in a 350 degree oven for about 15 minutes until they're all brown and crispy. And when they come out, it's gonna be almost hard to resist eating them right away, but they need to cool for about 45 minutes, which means by the time these are ready to eat, it's time to finish up the soup. I've taken my roasted tomatoes out of the oven and my kitchen smells fabulous. I removed all the thyme sprigs from the baking pan and I transferred everything else to the work bowl of my food processor. I'm gonna take about 20 pulses to puree this. Now what I'm going to do, I'm gonna remove the lid from my food processor. What I'm going to add is a half a cup of cream and my secret ingredient three quarters of a teaspoon of smoked paprika. Put the lid back on my food processor and now I'm gonna put about 10 to 15 seconds. Okay, take the lid off. Take the bowl off. Carefully remove the sharp blade. And I'm gonna transfer all of this. Oh, God, that smells so good. All of this. I'm going to add three cups of chicken stock. I'm just gonna put this on the stove top and bring it to a simmer and cook it for about five minutes. And it's time to eat. Smoky, sweet, soothing soup. Crispy, crunchy bagel chips. Bring on the raindrops. For these and all of my recipes, just go to my website. I do love me some tomato soup, and let me tell you, that recipe is absolutely delicious. Now remember, go to kitchenencounters.typepad.com for that recipe, along with others. We do have to take another break, but don't go anywhere. We talk to an allergist about the upcoming pollen season when we return. Welcome back to the center of it all. I thought we could leave you with a little information about spring allergies. They're coming in full force. Kids love springtime. It's a chance for them to get back outside to enjoy warmer weather. But as the flowers and trees spring back to life, some kids are affected by more than just their beauty. Dr. Brian Schroyer is a pediatric allergist at Cleveland Clinic Children's Hospital. He says many kids suffer from spring allergies this time of year. 
the easiest things for parents to notice will be sneezing and itching. But often the symptoms that bother the kids the most may be stuffiness of the nose or drippiness. Dr. Schroer says a child's allergy symptoms can be subtle. Symptoms may also include a cough that might be worse at night and in the morning. It may be the product of a running nose draining into the throat. Outdoor allergies include tree pollens, grasses, and weeds. But Dr. Schroer says it's the tree pollens that are the culprit this time of year. So he says to try to limit your child's exposure when pollen counts are at their highest. Closing the windows and running the central air may help, or you can try an over-the-counter medication. And for a more natural way to treat it, you could try a neti pot. Some kids with mild allergy symptoms may respond very well to over-the-counter, long-acting, non-sedating antihistamines. So that's loratadine, cetirizine, or fexofenadine, all of which come in kids' formulations and are indicated down to very young ages. Dr. Schroyer says if the over-the-counter antihistamines don't work, you should talk to your pediatrician. Well, best of luck if you have, s nope, D2 take three. Three, two. Well, best of luck if you have allergies. I'm developing seasonal ones, and that's no fun. That's the show. I hope you enjoyed it. Now remember to like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter and YouTube. Have a wonderful rest of your weekend.